Oh, oh, wait, wait. Ah, there we go. All right, guys, welcome back to Parkitect. And today I'll be trying to tackle Nova Labs. Now, the description of this scenario is that it was the set for some kind of sci-fi movie. And now it's up for sale for a theme park, which is a really cool trend, actually. There are a lot of theme parks in the world which are kind of based on that premise. We've got uh, some of the, like, the Hollywood-style parks of Universal and Disney as well. Also, some Italian park. Uh, there's actually lots of variations on this, but sci-fi is definitely a new take on that genre. But in any case, uh, the goals are, again, a bit of a step up from the last one. Um, we've got an optional goal that <laughs> I'm probably not going to reach. Uh, we can be sure of that by now, I think. But uh, let's just get started on the park. Now, I said in the end of the last episode that I wanted to try and see if I could maybe pull a steampunk theme out of this general sci-fi theme of the map. Uh, but that said, actually, what is what is my entrance? Uh, so this is the actual park, I suppose. Yeah, it looks that way. So it's really large, actually. Wow. So this is where the people are coming from. And... Uh, yeah, I'm I'm very curious actually what kind of scenery stuff I have because honestly it, it just kind of depends on what we get. Yeah, so all of this is really the sci-fi stuff and some more sci-fi stuff over here. Uh, but it looks like we're not getting any of the, the gears and cogs and stuff like that. So yeah, honestly... Forget about steampunk, that's probably not going to work. Maybe I'll try that one other day. The reason that I was thinking about it is because I saw some other people do it in some of their sandbox parks, and the game has amazing steampunk pieces, lots of little gears and cogs and spiraling coils and things that are really interesting and fun to use. Also some pipe works even. Um, but it looks like we're not going to get any of that stuff in this map. Not too much of an issue because I can also just try to work around a sci-fi theme. The only thing there is that, honestly, this is a theme which I'm not that good at, so I'm gonna try and get out of my comfort zone a little bit on this park. Uh, the second thing we should probably look at is the money. We've got quite a bit, so that's good. And very sci-fi-ish rides. Honestly, some of this stuff really fits into the theme. And really good coasters as well. I'm almost surprised that we got the steel coaster right off the bat, so that's really nice. I don't know if I want to go for that or a spinning coaster. I'm not the biggest fan of the powered coaster, even if it does fit the theme quite well. Um, but it's, I'm definitely going to start off with one of these two. And then the powered coaster could probably be the family-oriented ride of the park, because you'll often find that you know when a park doesn't have the sort of typical family coaster uh, that you normally see, they'll have a powered coaster or they'll have both, but they're definitely in the same kind of category. But yeah, it looks like we don't have too much stuff, so I definitely want to research the thrill rides, get a team to spend maybe a hundred bucks a month. And uh, actually quite important is the food. Okay, so we're, we're decent in this park, actually, because we've got a vending machine which sells chips. But I think researching stalls first might actually be a really good idea. I've gotten a lot of tips from people also that I should look more into researching uh, some of the shops. Just because on some of the later scenarios, you'll get some maps where you don't start off with either food or drinks at the beginning of a scenario. And you really have to make sure that you're selling both of these uh, just to be able to, you know, uh, make your guests stay alive probably. So that's pretty important. So I'm just going to research that and try to get started in the meantime. So I have no idea what I'm going to build, but I'm just going to start building some stuff. So let's go. All right. Now, before I get into the rest of the park, I wanted to change the existing scenery a little bit. Now, the limitations of the scenario are that you're not allowed to remove anything that's already there. But a little bit of a life hack there is that that doesn't count for recoloring stuff so you can recolor anything you want so that's also what I ended up doing as much as I think the existing colors worked fine as they were and were maybe actually a little bit better considering the theme I like to make everything a little bit more colorful and have different kinds of details in there so I decided to change the colors a little bit and add some stuff to it as well and I think that actually kind of reflects the general way in which I'm approaching 
this park. I just hit my pop filter as I often do. I hope I don't make too much of a noise doing that actually. But uh, yeah, basically I want to do this a bit differently than I normally do things. Normally I try to work on a very realistic, uh, very theme based way and try to build everything to be uh, very much based on real life theme parks or cities or cultures etc but in this case i mean we've got the sci-fi theme we're somewhere in outer space well presumably we're in some kind of studio that's been transformed into a theme park but it's all a little bit more fantastical so i'm not actually using any references in this case and i want to go a little bit out of my comfort zone and just go kind of crazy with this park. I was initially thinking of trying to stick with the theme that you get from the existing buildings, but I think it's better to maybe, you know, make sure that everything can fit into that same theme, but at the same time use this scenario as an opportunity to go a bit crazy with some of the elements in the, in the game and just experiment a lot. So that's what I'm gonna do. And maybe not everything is gonna stick. I'm really just gonna do whatever I can come up with at any given moment so it's all going to be a little bit strange but i do like doing it this way i think for me it's just more fun to try it this way and it's also something that i don't get to do all the time so over here for instance i'm building a very small food court and it really is small because it's just drinks actually and then there's a vending machine somewhere but i'm researching drinks in the meantime so that should be fine but yeah i thought it would be nice to experiment with some of these round corners pieces to create a uh, kind of pattern above this whole area to make everything look a little bit more interesting but it's just one of these little things where I thought it would be fun to mess with it a little bit so yeah I'm not gonna too strictly make sure that everything fits together in this park and it's just gonna be uh, quite a bit of a chaotic mess I would almost say that it's a bit inspired by Walibi Holland perhaps not in a sense of scenery but it's definitely a park that in recent years has been focusing a lot on getting different bright colors and these lots of very different areas in the park. And that sort of, uh, I don't know, that sort of way of looking at things, I would like to try to adopt for this park a little bit. Now over here is the first roller coaster. I decided to go for the spinning coaster in the end, just because it's a bit more cheap than the steel looping coaster and it's something for me to kind of base the layout of the park around as well and this might sound a little bit weird but um, I kind of struggle with trying to get a decent organic feeling layout in a park um, it's something that when I play Planet Coaster for instance I tend to experiment with a lot I tend to really try to lay out my parks as much as I can try to imagine where I want to place certain things and how everything's going to flow in my head and only after I know exactly what everything's going to look like in the end do I actually dare to start working on stuff but in this case it's just scenarios so I'm doing everything on the fly and I always like to have a bit of a guideline as to where things are going to go and how the general flow of the layout of the park is going to be and in some scenarios you pretty much get that handed to you. So in Mystic Oasis or Victoria Lake, you very much have these park layouts, like the natural terrain just sort of helps you to find your way, I think, especially if you have these kind of lakes to follow or these sort of valleys to build in. But in this case, it's a completely flat valley. So there's nothing really to base my, my general flow of the park on. So I like having this spinning coaster as something not quite as a centerpiece but something to work around um, and that's also why the layout is a little bit you know meandering through the park i was initially inspired by dragon's fury i think that's what it's called in chessington's world of adventures i don't know if that's the name of the uh, coaster i'm not quite sure but their spinning coaster also has that way of moving around the park and not just being limited to one location and I thought that's quite nice for a spinning coaster and a good way to provide some sort of context, something to build around as well because obviously I can't build underneath the coaster so the park layout is just going to sort of follow the layout of the spinning coaster here which is also fun because it gives you a lot of interaction between 
the coaster and the various rides and paths and stuff like that that's going to be built around it. Now over here I just built that uh, motion simulator which I thought was interesting because it's built on top of one of these buildings that you get with the scenario. So I wasn't allowed to remove anything about that building but I thought it would be fun to add something on top of it just to make things a little bit more interesting and the motion simulator is a tiny flat ride that sits on such a small footprint that it can just kind of work on that little overhang over there uh, where you can see it sort of looking out over the paths as you're walking on the paths themselves. So I think that was quite nice. Also decided to do a little bit of lighting and yeah, everything is going to be pretty colorful, I do have to say. Also one of these things where it's a bit more different than what I usually like to do because I'm almost too careful always with colors, trying to not mix too many different colors at the same time. But in this case, I just want to try and get all kinds of different colors out there. Also to sort of prevent the whole gritty industrial colorless look that uh, is a bit of a trap almost, I feel, of sci-fi builds. And I should, I should also say actually, I didn't really look up any inspiration. Now this was a question which I got on the last video and this is something that I've talked about before in some of my other series but given that this series has a lot of new viewers or people who are just here for Parkitect, um, I'm pretty down to talk about this again. So basically I don't really read books or articles or anything about the styles of architecture that I build. Like a lot of it is just sort of winging it, uh, looking up stuff on the internet, looking up uh, pictures for reference or inspiration. That said, whenever I do a certain style, I tend to go on a bit of a Google spree and Wikipedia spree to get some of the basics down. Um, but I'm not really that knowledgeable. Like everything that I talk about in a lot of my videos, a lot of that isn't, you know, just that I'm I know everything about all kinds of different architectures and cultures, but it's just because I tend to look up that stuff just before I move into recording that video. Um, but that's basically my process. I decide on a certain theme just because out of some kind of interest that I have, and then I just research it a little bit before I move into it. But in this case, since this is some kind of sci-fi outer space theme, there's not really anything that I have to base it on. So for a bit of inspiration, I actually went back to an old Rollercoaster Coon 3 build of mine called Protoss. And some of that stuff will definitely come back later in this video. For uh, example, it's just in the idea of using these different colored trees and very gritty industrial but colorful style of the park. I think for me, Protoss was the first time when I started experimenting very much with an outer space sci-fi theme in the context of a roller coaster with lots of colored foliage and random details everywhere. And following that general same style for me is uh, something that helped me along this scenario. Now I'm, I'm running behind a little bit again. So over here we've got the seating, uh, seating area, I guess. There's not too many benches, but there's a few. But I, it, was, it was more or less actually an excuse to try that path pattern with the different purple colors. And then again, using the uh, the roof cornice pieces just for an interesting pattern. I think those things are kind of similar to what I believe you call a mandala. I'm not quite sure, but it's one of those like round doodle paintings that uh, a lot of adults now do as a coloring activity. Whatever, one of those round interesting little pattern things. It's, it's something like that, I suppose. It's just fun to mess around with these things until you get something that looks interesting. I think one of the things which I do like about doing this kind of scenario is that for me, I can think a bit outside of the box. I, oops, yeah, I hit my pop filter again. Uh, but yeah, I can think a little bit more outside of the box because I usually tend to do things quite safely and also just use some of the pieces very differently. Uh, for me, in general, one of the most important things, whether it would be in Roller Coaster Country or Planet Coast or Park Tech or any of these sort of creative games, is not to look at pieces and then think of what you should use them for, uh, but really just to come up with something you want to build and then see whatever pieces can help you build that. So 
I never really want to scroll through the items looking for my next thing to build. And I think that's uh, a trap that a lot of people fall into. You just kind of scroll through the menu, uh, you know, looking at what you have, kind of thinking, well, what can I actually do anything with? And for me, it honestly works a lot better to just think of random ideas of what I want to try building somewhere and then scrolling through the, uh, the different items to see what can help me build that. And I mean, that's generally how I ended up coming up with weird strategies like using chimney pieces to build pillars and things like that. It's not that you have to think out of the box per se, but just having a certain goal in mind and then looking at the pieces uh, for me at least, and I think this goes for a lot of people though, it can really help to use the pieces in different creative ways and in ways that they might not be supposed to be used, which is always a good thing, I think. Um, so yeah, that's my strategy for using scenery pieces in creative games is almost like my strategy in a supermarket, honestly. Looking up first what I want to get and honestly, when I'm in a store, I just run right away to whatever aisle I need to get whatever item, get everything straight away and leave the store again. I guess that's that's honestly a, a good analogy for me in, in, in the whole like item menus in creative video games as well. God, I, I, I swear I just came up with that, but I think actually it kind of works. In any case, uh, some of the scenery over here is quite simple. I decided to add a small food court-ish area with that red building over there just because it fills up the space quite nicely. And as a final thing of this part of the time-lapse, I decided to add this Gravitron. I think that's what it's called. Very sci-fi looking ride, of course. And um, just slap some weird scenery around it. I'm actually not too sure about how well these things worked out, but I just decided to build some weird stuff around it and see what sticks, more or less. And also a little bit of shade, because we are in the desert overall, over here. And I don't know, it doesn't look like the, de the, like the climate is very hot, but still something that I want to try and feature here, uh, here and there at least. In any case, let's get back into a quick real time section and see how the park is doing. Now this little park is definitely not as profitable as I was hoping it to be. The top spin over here is making some decent-ish money. The Gravitron is making alright money, sort of comparable. Motion Simulator is not even doing as good as I expected and the spinning coaster over here, uh, that's that's a mediocre ride. So actually this park is uh, kind of a fail. It's stagnating and if I keep going like this it's definitely not going to end up too well. That said, I'm not going to build this up like some kind of dramatic YouTube video. We don't have that kind of narrative here. It's going to be fine anyway. I just need to keep in mind that I'm not going to be able to finish the park like this. So I'm definitely going to have to take a loan and build something much more thrilling to attract more guests. Besides, I don't even have a staff room yet. So that's also a disaster waiting to happen. I need to fix that as soon as possible. And then there's a... This stuff, like the thunderstorms, which makes it even more difficult. So I'm going to try as soon as possible to get a decent loan. Now, all of these have pretty high monthly fees as well, unfortunately. So whatever I build is going to have to save the park. So, of course, it's going to hopefully have to look pretty good. But it's also going to have to be pretty intense. And, uh, I mean... When I think about it, I honestly need to stop researching shops because I've got the hot dogs now, I'm gonna get the burgers. What I really need, I think, is probably going to be a coaster. Actually, no, maybe I can research thrill rides and finish the coaster selection with a steel coaster and a powered coaster. Whatever happens, I'm definitely gonna have to build the steel coaster next, make it a good thrilling ride to make about a thousand dollars profit a month or something like that or this park is just gonna crash and burn so yeah let's go back into the time lapse and try to fix this mess now before i talk a little bit more about this coaster i want to give a bit of uh, an announcement as to why it's taken me so long to record this episode because right here there's a small time skip of about three weeks from when you just heard me to when you're hearing me right now 
basically I got sick, uh, then it was holiday, so I traveled around for a little bit. And then when, when I got back and I wanted to record some stuff, I got sick again. It's not too bad, I've been able to record some time lapse, um, but my voice wasn't really in a state where I felt comfortable recording any commentaries for it. And to be quite honest, it still isn't really, so I'm gonna edit out the cuffs out of this recording. But if you can hear that my voice isn't what it's usually like, then that's the reason. I'm still going through a cold, but I really want to record this right now because I've been getting so many questions from people as to why it's taken me so long to release this new episode. Um, but yeah, that's basically uh, the reason. I've had this time lapse right here waiting for me to record over it and I just couldn't find the time to do it. So I'm sorry about that. It's a bit of my own management problems as well because I should really have a sort of backup plan or some kind of backup videos at hand, but I really don't. I record this stuff as I go, which works fine as long as I, uh, I'm able to record videos, but I wasn't really for the past time. So yeah, that's what's going on. Don't want to dwell on that for too much longer though, but just so you know, that's why I sound like this. So this coaster itself, let's talk about that for a little bit. So it's, uh, I think, I would suppose that it's a, a Premiere inspired coaster. So Premiere makes these LIM launch coasters like uh, Mount Freeze, Reverse Blast and also Full Throttle, but that's a bit of a more new gen thing. Um, but yeah, it makes these coasters and they kind of look like this coaster in game, even though this coaster is the sort of in-universe Schwarzkopf looping coaster. I think the track style is very reminiscent also of the Premier launch coasters, so that was my starting point for this one. So it starts off with a simple LIM launch into a uh, top hat, which I, that is a, a bit of a difference because these coasters in real life would be an LSM launch, if I remember correctly. But yeah, the start is a bit inspired by coasters like King Daka or um, well, top thrilled Rexter, but then it actually does something with it. So we get a pit, uh, a part where it just kind of curves around this first launch section. Then one really big airtime hill over the pathway and over the station, where I wanted to add a little bit more decoration to this as well because the color scheme is quite simple. It's just black on black. So I wanted to give it some more touches to make it a bit more interesting. So we've got the red and white uh, launch section. And I think this red and white sort of um, color scheme works really well for these industrial looking things. I don't know when it sort of became the code for dangerous things, but you know, power cables and chimneys very often have these kinds of color schemes. So I like to slap this onto industrial themed launch coasters. Um, so it works for the launch section as well as those support towers which are at once a sort of theming object because I think they look pretty neat, uh, but they're also pretty necessary because the supports disappeared because of the path underneath it. And I want to actually return to the colors because I think it's a bit of a handy tip actually. The paintbrush tool, which you can see on the bottom there next to the bulldozer, actually paints brushes a lot more than you might expect. So you can use it to paint the track like I just did and give different parts of track a different color, but you can also paint individual cars of coasters, for instance. So you can actually go ham with the different color options that you have with this thing. So yeah, definitely one of my favorite tools in the game and combined with the pipette tool to color colors from existing scenery and buildings, it's a super powerful tool. So uh, definitely uh, something to keep in mind there. And for the station, I'm following a color related approach, which is very similar to the rest of the park. And I think it's the one thing that sort of pulls the park together. Uh, so if you look at it from a distance, the main colors are all black and gray and light gray, very nitty gritty industrial kind of colors. Um, but I'm trying to detail everything and put these little elements everywhere with all kinds of different colors like orange and purple and blue and red to make the park much more interesting on the eye. And I think that's also the one thing that sort of pulls the park together. I'm trying something new in every single area, but there's always this sort of connecting trend of mostly dark grayscale colors, uh, which are detailed with different, very bright color elements. So I think that's one thing that sort of pulls the park together, even though it's uh, <laughs> random and kind of all over the place. 
So over here, I decided to make an indoor queue line, actually, which is not something you can really see. I thought it would be interesting to put something inside there just for the, the heck of it. Um, but it's, it's not something that you can see in a normal playthrough. Unless you install mods where you can go into a first person perspective, but for this playthrough I'd like to keep the, ga the game completely mod free. Um, just to experience the campaign as you would in a vanilla game. Also some of the mods do break the game and they would make the campaign easier and uh, I don't want to do that to myself. But yeah, I also thought this queue line indoors would work quite well because it looks a bit like an industrial backlot building, which is... In hindsight, something that I think the park needs more than I ended up doing it, because this is one of the few cases where I did this. Just because in the end, the setting of this park is that it's some kind of abandoned movie site, some kind of set for an alien landscape and not actually a real alien landscape. So some of these backlog buildings help sort of, you know, make that context very clear. And in the end, I think I could have done that much more because in the end this is a super surrealistic and alien looking park and much more out there than all of the other scenarios so far. But that's also what I kind of like about it. It's it's not just about the final you know outcome. I, I also do want to have some fun building it. So this was a nice opportunity to just go around and mess with different things for every single area of the park. And some of it worked, some of it didn't quite work as well. Like this little sort of centerpiece that I was trying to build here. I wanted to have some kind of spiraling centerpiece, but given these very edgy pieces, it didn't really work out too well. So I ended up going for something really similar uh, or something really different, I should say. Uh, and I still don't quite know what this thing is, but it looks pretty fancy and scientific or something like that. So yeah, I'll keep that in there. And uh, aside from that, there isn't too much to be done for this part of the park. Just some finishing touches around the coaster. But um, I think it's a good time to move on to the next coaster because this scenario actually ended up uh, having a lot of really big coasters and being basically a sandbox for trying out different coaster layouts. So yeah, let's check it out. So the next coaster is going to be a B&M floorless coaster and I think this is the first one in the playthrough so far. It's not the first B&M, but these coasters are always quite expensive and quite a major investment. Not just in park text, but in a real life context as well. You usually just find these things in really large, rich parks. Um, so I don't get to build these kinds of coasters too often in scenarios either. It's more of a, a late game coaster. And in this case, I left my game running for a little bit, so there's a small time skip here, just to get some more money. But it turns out that the uh, coaster that I just built made a lot more money than I expected. I think it's my most profitable one so far. In the beginning, it was pulling in $2,000 every month. So I ended up being a lot more rich than I expected and with more money than I knew to do with. So uh, hence I decided to build this floorless coaster to try and burn through some of that money. Now this layout particularly is inspired by Hair Razor in Hong Kong's Ocean Park, which is one of my personal favorite floorless coasters. I should add to that, I haven't been on it myself. It's uh, one of my favorites in terms of what I've seen POVs for on the internet. It looks super cool though. It's based on, it, it's built on a, a cliffside next to the ocean in Hong Kong. It's really compact, but it still manages to do a lot of different things with the layout. It has a super cool color scheme as well that I end up copying in a lot of my coasters. And uh, yeah, just overall a super cool ride. And I definitely want to travel to Hong Kong one day. And when I do, I should definitely give that coaster a visit. So this, uh, the inspiration I think is mostly visible in the mix of different elements and the way that the layout is shaped with that curved drop first into the loop, into the dive loop, and then sort of going back and forth with different inversions until you're out of potential energy and you just return to the station or the brake run, I should say. And then that's the end of it. Now for the station this time, I decided to do something a little bit different, although it's very similar to stations that I've built so far, and I kind of want to throw back to Rollercoaster Tycoon 3, and I don't know how many of you guys remember this, but in the custom scenery community of Rollercoaster Tycoon 3, there was this guy called Stuck71, I believe, and he made a few industrial-themed custom scenery sets, 
Uh, one of them I think was HDR 51 and HDR 71, which were these hangar styled sets. And these hangar pieces look quite similar to the, uh, the Park Tech pieces as well. But what's most striking is his SKR91 set. I think that's what it's called. It's, it's years ago. But uh, these were some of the most popular custom scenery sets in the game ever. Um, and this last set, it included a bunch of pavilions and archways, which look very similar to the ones that we've got in Park Tech. And I think because of that, I really like to use these things. And I really like to use them, especially for stations. Uh, I'll try and pull up a picture over here. Uh, in, in case you're wondering what these things look like. So you could see what they look like. So you could see that they are super similar to the Park Tech ones. And if you go back to old Rollercoaster Tycoon 3 videos from around 2010, everybody's using these things to build stations with them. So I guess that's what I tend to do a lot in my videos as well. In any case, it's time to move on to a different area and leave the Florida's coaster behind us and start to build a Gerslauer Eurofighter. And I was wondering for a while if I wanted to build a Eurofighter. I had the space and money to build a hyper coaster, which is something that you don't do very often in scenario play. But uh, you know, I figured that the theme would fit mostly a Eurofighter coaster, especially something like Takabisha, uh, which is a coaster in Fuji-Q Highland in Japan, which is a park that I have a vlog of on my computer that I still haven't finished editing and I've been there over a year ago right now, which is a, a bit embarrassing. Maybe I'll get to that one day. But yeah, it's a park in Japan. It's really well known for having some of the most thrilling coasters in the world. It has Takabisha, which has the steepest drop in the world. It has Dododompa, which is the fastest launch in the world. It doesn't quite hit the highest speed. It's definitely up there with the fastest coasters in the world. Uh, but the thing that makes it so special is that it hits its uh, ridiculous speed in I think it goes 180 kilometers or something like that in about 1.6 seconds something like that it's it's an insane launch nothing compares to it and then it also has Ijanaika which is I believe the biggest 4d coaster in the world and also absolutely insane but yeah I was mostly interested in Takabisha which I think is a bit underrated in the roster of coasters that the park has even though they're all pretty ridiculous uh, Takabisha, I think, is a coaster that does almost everything a coaster can do. It has a launch, it has a lift hill, it has all kinds of different elements, including the super unique banana roll. And um, what it also does is it has a barrel roll right at the start of the ride. So that's something that you can find back in this coaster. I didn't feature a launch because, well, we can't. And I also made it a little bit smaller than Takabisha because it had to fit in the scenario after all. Um, and even though it might not look too much like Takabisha actually overall, what mostly inspired me was the way that it moves from one unique element into the other. It's just lots of inversions followed up by other inversions, one after the other. And that's what I really like about the coaster. It has a really cool sort of momentum to it, a really cool rhythm to the different elements, which I think is pretty underrated. I really like it for that reason. And uh, this coaster does a sort of similar thing. We start off with uh, the Beyond Vertical Drop, not quite as steep as the Kabishas, but definitely beyond vertical there. Into a zero G roll, into a Cobra roll, and then a sort of Stengel dive, I suppose it would be. Uh, and then into this weird element with a corkscrew and a half roll, into a dive loop, and finally a corkscrew. So lots of different inversions after, the, after each other there. All of them are different than the one before it, and all of them are taking the, the inversion at a very similar speed. Um, so that's the sort of design philosophy, I suppose, of Takabisha that went into this ride. As for the color scheme, it's a bit more colorful. A lot of the coasters so far in the park have been a bit bleak and a bit gray. So I thought it'd be nice to have a very bright uh, blue color for this one. And uh, moving into this area also, again, new colors for the paths and a sort of new approach to how the uh, paths look. This thing is also definitely not going to be very efficient. There's no block brakes in the middle of the ride and these Eurofighter cars are quite small. So it's not the best choice if you want to make money. But as you can see, money is flowing in way faster than I can ever wish to spend it. So I'm already way too rich on this scenario. Also, quite far ahead in terms of the years. It's been taking me quite a while to build this one, I guess. Um, Oh yeah, and also, here's the indoor barrel roll. I should probably talk about that a little bit. It's a bit of a typical thing for 
Eurofighters and Gerslauer coasters in general to have an indoor barrel roll. Now, I'm not going to spoil any coasters because a lot of times this is sort of a surprise element for first time riders. So I don't want to tell you which coasters have this indoor barrel roll, but it's it's definitely something that a lot of indoor Gerslauer coasters have. So I figured I would also put it on this coaster. It doesn't really make too much sense per se from an in-game perspective because I'm not going to do a POV where you can actually see the inside of the building. But I think it works as a, something which just makes the coaster make a bit more sense if you're looking at it from above. It also gives me an excuse to build another building and help to add to the overall sci-fi vibe of the park. So yeah, I think that works quite well. But the coaster, in the end, you know, it doesn't really have the job of making money. I figured, given how many guests the coaster so far brought in, that if I built one more major coaster, as well as two extra flat rides, I'd be able to reach the guest goal for this scenario, and I'd be able to finish the park with this coaster. I was actually thinking for a while that I might build another coaster, uh, something really big, but in the end the park is already getting pretty full and it's also getting pretty laggy, I have to admit. There's a lot of different pieces in here and a lot more guests than the scenario so far. So I was getting done with this thing, it wasn't too bad, but it was definitely getting more annoying on the recording side of it, so definitely want to move on after this coaster. But I don't want to stop yet, I do want to give it a bit of a nice theming. So the station is pretty simple, didn't want to do too much with that. It's a, a bit of an old looking station actually, it looks very similar to uh, sort of 60s, 70s roller coaster stations except with much more sci-fi materials. So it's almost got a sort of retro sci-fi look to it. Um, but yeah, that's that's not too important, I guess. Although I, I think it does work if you're building sci-fi parks to just make it really absurd or try and go for a retro sci-fi. Because if you go for a futuristic idea of, you know, what is deemed futuristic at the time, it's still going to age horribly. Uh, so if you look, for instance, at the original Tomorrowland of Disneyland, you can clearly tell that that's what the past would think the future would look like. Um, so if you want to try and stop your sci-fi things from aging really badly. It really helps to make it very surrealistic or um, make clear that it's some sort of past idea of what the future would be like, something like steampunk for instance. What's also kind of funny I think is uh, during this playthrough I did this thing which I sometimes do and try to listen to very thematic music that works to the theme of what I'm doing. So. I was actually looking into sci-fi themed music albums for this one, ended up doing a little bit of Discovery, uh, doing a little bit of David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust of course, uh, but also Janelle Monet and, um, god, I forgot the name recently, but uh, just lots of sci-fi albums and I don't know if it really particularly gets me into the mood. But I just think it's fun to explore music of a, a particular type whenever I'm doing a, a, a certain themed park. So yeah, that was, that's what I was listening to during these things. Uh, for, th for those who don't know, I just like to put up some music while I record time lapses. Oh, right, that's it. Deltron 3030 was also something that I listened to a lot for this playthrough. And it just, I don't know, it, it's it's nice to... It's a nice opportunity to discover music as well because I like to do something else while I'm listening to music but uh, definitely not something that takes too much of my focus and on the other hand I like to do something while I'm recording videos but something that doesn't take too much of my focus away so what I built doesn't look terrible and for me listening to music is just the best way to play these kinds of games so yeah that's a bit of I guess interesting information about me. In any case, uh, decided to finish up the queue uh, very simply by meandering underneath the coaster track. I wasn't really intending to do that at first, but then I discovered that I sort of wiggled my way into a dead end with the uh, low to the ground coaster track that was moving everywhere, so I had to find some way to move underneath that. And uh, also I put all of these little roofs not at different random places, they are at all the places where the path is very close to or right underneath coaster track just to 
you know, protect against loose items that fall off the coaster. It happens a lot to hats and phones and cameras. So uh, that's always a concern with roller coasters. And finally, it was time to spruce up the place with some foliage, no pun intended. Well, actually, maybe I did intend that. Maybe I made that pun too many times already. Anyway, um, I think the foliage is one of the, th one of the key things that actually pulls this park together. Because usually I like to have different parts of the park have slightly different foliage. Um, but in this case, I wanted to have the same trees everywhere because the park is already very much all over the place and everything looks very different. So having the weird surrealistic sort of alien foliage at least be the same everywhere uh, gives it a bit of, con uh, I, I guess, continuity, continuity, yeah, there we go. So yeah, I think that works alright. Even though the foliage for me, it, it's still something that I do know is quite controversial. When I originally made Protoss in Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, I ended up getting a lot of mixed reactions from the for the foliage and spent a lot of time tinkering with the different colors of trees. But in this case, I think the different hues of pink and purple and red and green work quite all right with each other. I didn't actually pull that from an existing color scheme, but yeah, I just thought this worked best. So I'm actually gonna leave it like it is. In any case, that's it for the scenario. So let's take a look around and check out all of the coasters and stuff that I did in the final part of this time lapse. All right, so here's the park. I'm gonna try my best to keep my voice okay during this recording. I've got my water right here. I'm also sorry about the uh, some of the distortion on the last vocal clip. I only realized at the end of that entire recording that the gain on my mic was a bit too high and I honestly didn't want to go back to it because it was already the second re-recording of that part and um, I wasn't really feeling like recording that at the time. So I'm sorry about that. I'll try to actually pay more attention to that. I can at least see right now in OBS that my mic was clipping when I was recording a little bit of a test audio. So that's something to keep in mind. In any case, this is the park and it might be a little bit laggy on you guys' side. Although I do have to say, it's less leggy than I expected it to be. Uh, also, yeah, there was a comment a long time ago that technically it's not lag, it's just a stuttering frame rate, which is uh, totally true. It's not actually online. It's just what uh, I suppose that's the gamer term for it, more or less at this point. But yeah, the frame rate, I think, is pretty decent. It's not even doing too bad. So none of the rides have actual names, but I still want to do a quick tour of the different coasters and then just show some different points of interest in the park. I'm just gonna wait for the Eurofighter to finish its little round over here. I never quite fixed the timing on this thing. I'm actually gonna have to put the minimum waiting time on about 35 seconds as well, I think, uh, because it stalls on the lift hill here, which is not the, the best thing to look at. In any case, let's zoom in on this car right here and see what the layout is like. So yeah, first drop, this is all pretty standard fare for a Eurofighter, even if this is quite a large Eurofighter. It's not as big as Takabisha, but definitely a similar size. On Cobra Rolls, by the way, you always want to make sure that it's a little bit banked between those two corkscrews into a sort of stangle dive, into this crazy element over here, and a dive loop. And the overall pacing I'm actually quite happy with. Even on the airtime hill, you never really get super ridiculous airtime on Eurofighter coasters, but you do have some every now and then, and that's basically the ride. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with this thing actually. I'm gonna see how well this actually works as a blueprint, because it does have that sort of gimmicky barrel roll at the start over here, and it's also slightly built on a, uh, on a slope, so not quite sure how well that's going to work out, but I definitely want to look into it. Now the surrounding area is pretty simple. I just noticed I didn't actually open the 4D cinema. So let's just do that right away. That should work just like that. People are absolutely killing themselves on this ride. I would never want to ride one of these things, I think. I don't know. It all just depends on how comfortable the restraints are. But a lot rides on the restraints here. Now also in the meantime, I'm reaching the goals and... I wasn't quite sure if I would because I do need to have an experiences rating of at least 70% and it's a little bit close to that. But uh, yeah, it looks like the park is actually doing okay in that regard. So I'm just gonna 
save real quick and then get back to it to look at this guy. Oh, wait a second. I do want to get into the camera here. So yeah, there we go. Let's launch and see what this looks like. We're going to reach the goals in the meantime. Uh, but that doesn't disturb the POP. Nice. Awesome. So we get to see that coaster riding through the confetti. There's not a lot of people on this train, actually. It's empty except for one guy. Anyway, a uh, cool little airtime hill over here, which is just some floater airtime realistically, but I think it works alright. And into the final transition, which is surprisingly smooth. I'm still impressed by how smooth that curves, uh, that curve and the uh, pull out into the final brake run ends up working. So pretty cool coaster. Actually, this is my favorite from the entire scenario, I think. I just like the red and white color scheme that's going on here, as well as the uh, very picturesque layout, I think. This would be one that would be really interesting to watch from the paths with that sort of uh, flying elements over this main pathway and the first top hat with the surrounding structures. I think it would be a nice coaster in terms of skyline. That's definitely something that I always like to uh, look out for as well. Uh, so we've got this thing. A um, bit of some interesting Q shenanigans going on for this coaster. I lately find it pretty fun to mess around with the different glass pieces and give them different colors and try and make different shapes out of them. Didn't really get anything too uh, spectacular done so far. Um, but especially as you get to a bigger skill, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be done with that. But uh, next, I really want to follow the Floorless Coaster. And I'm actually kind of curious how well it's doing. It's making a, a decent bit of money there. Just because these things are so incredibly efficient. So yeah, let's follow this train. Should be able to get going straight from the lift hill over here. Yeah, the timing on this thing, on the uh, brake runs, is actually quite good. And on the launch coaster, I'm actually using the block brake timing to make sure that the coaster stops just before the launch, which I think works out quite nicely as well. So, a very simple, sort of standard floorless coaster layout, starting off with a loop into, I think it was an Immelman? Yeah, and then into a corkscrew. Actually, it's a little bit smaller and shorter than most real-life floorless coasters would be. But the layout just worked really well like this, so I wanted to keep it this way. So yeah, that's that ride. God, I kind of want to wait until the rain is over to actually point out some other things. But no, I think it'll be fine. Something that I also did here and there to try and make this park feel more connected, even though everything just looks completely different and I'm trying new things with new pieces in every section, is to have some colors that you know, are the same in terms of accents and stuff uh, in different parts of the park. So the, the same kind of orange is used on the trim of this building as well as the umbrellas and some of the details of the station and queue line of this coaster and even this pavilion of this coaster over here. Um, so that's just one of those details that I think sort of pull the park together a little bit more. Um, looking around for some similar things. Right, there's the color red in this area with the red queue line, the, uh, the red flat ride, and the red trims on this building. So, a lot of very similar colors over there as well. Over here, I've also got some of those red trims coming back as well, some blues here and there. So yeah, overall, I'm trying to give everything slightly different colors, but if you zoom out, you'll be able to sort of see that there's a different sort of color palettes for different areas like they've all got their own sort of look we've got the area over here with the floorless coaster uh, the sort of plaza within the middle the gravitron uh, alongside the launch coaster over here then the starting area has its own sort of look and then finally the the dark red paths over here at the Eurofighter coaster which um, sometimes the coloring is also just very much related to the ride so for this coaster for instance We've got the turquoise track, which I believe turquoise doesn't really come back anywhere else in this area. But the very dark, bright pink of the supports uh, come back in the, uh, the walls on the bottom of the station building, as well as some parts of the queue, actually, the covered parts, and also this pavilion at the start of the entrance. So, especially when it comes to coasters and their own surroundings and pathways and queues and station buildings, I always like to bring back the colors of the coaster itself 
in a very subtle way. So yeah, that's just a, a little bit of tips, I suppose, on certain things. In the end, I, I'm pretty happy with this park, honestly. It worked out a little bit better than I expected, uh, but I do have to say, doing something like this isn't entirely my strong suit, and if I ever get to build another sci-fi park like this, be it in a scenario or sandbox, I would well, probably prefer to get back to the approach of trying to make everything in the same style and trying to make it fit into one certain structure or theme or something like that. This is a little bit too over the place, I think. Uh, all over the place, I mean. And come think of it, did I ever do a POV of the spinning coaster? I don't think I really did. In any case, let's just follow this thing around. It's pretty simple. But it's definitely the ride that has the largest amount of interaction with the other parts of the park, all of the different paths and areas. Um, a bit of a journey actually across the park and also the only real family ride. I was kind of thinking that I was missing a family coaster in this park but yeah, I didn't want to build another family coaster and spend a lot of time on that. I, At that point when I was considering it I thought it would be much more fun to build the Eurofighter instead, so uh, there's that. The kids are just gonna have to ride this thing, it's not actually that intense to be honest. But yeah, that is basically the park. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode even though it wasn't quite the usual fare in terms of content and my commentary and um, let's try to make it better again next time. Uh, speaking of next time, I'm pretty much done with this thing, so we can quit and see what else we're gonna get. Alright, so we finished Nova Labs, we can play it in the sandbox now, and I don't think we're gonna get anything else. Uh, oh, yeah, actually we do. We're just gonna skip straight ahead to whatever is gonna be there. Okay, so I am a little bit curious, I'm not gonna play this in the next episode, but... Okay, okay, that's Adventure Island, alright. Good to know. So that's one that I made, but we'll get to that later. For now, I want to focus on Archipelago Adventures, which is one of the scenarios that I believe this is one of the scenarios that Joshua made. Not quite sure, but actually yeah, I'm pretty sure. So I'll tackle that next time. It's going to be a pretty challenging one, and the terrain is definitely going to be very different from everything that we've seen so far. So I think it'll be very interesting. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.